My name is Stephen Villano, and I am the director of the Center for Public Service and Community Research. And uh, the center is what puts on these Vital Voices uh, events. I can't think of a more vital uh, voice to talk about than sex trafficking in, uh, in our area. Um, I'm surprised it's not quite frankly talked about more. It's just that important that we shine a light on this issue. So I'm grateful that you all are here. Um, this is the first time uh, that I've been here in the six years that I've been here that we've ever done a Vital Voices on more than one night. So this is the first time we've done a three-night Vital Voices. That goes to show you how important I felt that this issue was. And this is the first time that we've had a student uh, completely put the show on, so to speak. Uh, Rhonda Kirkendall here. I guess she doesn't need any introduction, but Rhonda is the uh, is the person who, you know, when I said to her, hey, you know, I had this idea, and uh, she was like, I'll do it. Let me, let me do it. And I'm like, well, oh, okay. And she did it. She, every single aspect of this was coordinated, thought of, inspired by Rhonda. I, she would come to me and say, what about this? Yep. What about that? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Go. And she did everything. And as you know, Rhonda spends a lot of time in the, uh, getting uh, laws passed or changed or amended uh, at uh, in Austin. Um, she just told me about another speaking opportunity she's going to have. I'm sure she'll share it with you, or hopefully she will. Um, and so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Rhonda Kirkendall. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Villano. It is a pleasure to introduce the UHD Sex Trafficking in Houston Hidden in Plain Sight Symposium. In addition to everyone that is in person, we also have a virtual audience as well. So why are we saying sex trafficking in Houston hidden in plain sight? For everyone in this audience tonight and everyone that's virtually, the next time that you go out and run errands, whether you're going to the grocery store, the post office, the nail salon, there are victims among you hidden in plain sight. It is our goal tonight to be able to help you understand what sex trafficking is and how to identify it, how to report it. That was day one. Tonight, we are talking about meeting the needs of survivors. We are going to hear about programs directed towards adult survivors, child survivors. We're also going to hear about survivors who have been incarcerated and the work that's being done there. And then last but not least, we are going to hear about justice. We're going to hear from our assistant district attorneys from Fort Bend County DA's office on how to pr prosecute trafficking. And so uh, at the end of this presentation, we're going to have a panel discussion with three survivors. It is so very easy to listen to sex trafficking on an academic level, but when you hear the real lived experience stories of survivors, it touches you in a different way. And we hope that at the end of this, you will be able to take away and do something. And so um, we know that this is a difficult subject matter. We're gonna be talking about sex trafficking, sexual exploitation, violence, both in person and virtually. If at any time you feel uncomfortable, overwhelmed, please feel free to step out, get a drink of water, take a deep breath, and when you're ready, come back in. I would love to introduce you to Becca Carey with Hands of Justice. Becca is a force of nature. The work that she does here locally for survivors in the greater Houston area, but also the human trafficking awareness that she does at the state level and at the national level is really unbelievable. Tonight, she will be covering restorative services and economic empowerment. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, it's a pl uh, privilege and an honor to be here with you guys tonight. Um, wanted to, again, share that I am the founder of Hands of Justice, which is an economic empowerment um, anti-trafficking nonprofit in Montgomery County. We're located up in Conroe, Texas, but we do work nationwide. And I'll share a little bit a little bit more about what we do in a minute. But um, 
I also share with everybody that I am a survivor of domestic sex trafficking myself, and I love to advocate for the fact that we need survivor inclusion within anti-trafficking as well as economic empowerment. Um, I don't think that enough people understand why economic empowerment for survivors are so important. And so today that's a little bit why I'm going to um, share with you and why um, what we do is so impactful. Whoop, wrong way. There we go. So um, why is economic empowerment so important for survivors? Um, basically, economically, these men and women are coming out of something where they have not had a chance to make their own decisions for themselves. And they're needing to relearn a lot of these skills or learn them um, skills that they've never had before. And so that's literally where we come. We're just walking alongside these survivors. We're asking them to continue to live life on their terms, but allowing us to come in and just support them along the way instead of on the other side of telling them how to do it. Um, we are just there to support them in doing it. There's a lot of different reasons why economic empowerment is so important. Um, a lot of, there is a myth, I believe, that a lot of people think that when you come out of the life that you immediately are rescued and, and swept away and put into the safe homes. Um, that does happen for a very small percentage of survivors. Do you guys understand that? A lot of these men and women are out there doing life on their own after having survived severe trauma, not knowing that there's even any reason resources available to them, let alone um, people that can support them. So again, that's why we come in. Many survivors do not enter programs and not doing life on their own. So and the reason is because a lot of us will self-identify years after our abuse. Um, we don't just come out of the life saying, oh, I was a victim. We have to learn that sometimes, that that's what happened to us. I self-identified 15 years after I was trafficked. By that time, I was married. I had good jobs. I was enrolled in college. But when I self-identified, that came all crashing down on me, and I needed resources at that point to help. And again, that's where we come in. Um, some safe houses, are, again, are just not conducive to the situation of the survivor. Again, a lot of these men and women are married. They have kids. They're um, working legitimate jobs. Uh, they're in school. And, and giving all of that up to go into a safe house is just not practical, right? So again, there's not enough beds, and there's not enough funding for beds. I think they're saying there's about 1,600 beds nationwide now um, available nationwide. And um, in the state of Texas right now, they're saying there's about 313,000 victims. So that puts things in perspective there, right? Um, economic empowerment also promotes a feeling of safety and security by equipping a survivor to, um, to learn and know that there are practical resources out there. Again, we're not doing it for them. We're just supporting them along the way. Um, it helps reduce the risk factors of what might have been vulnerable, their vulnerability, I can never say that word, sorry, vulnerability that led to their explo exploitation in the first place. Um, and it provides opportunities for survivors to participate in their own healing journey um, by making the decisions that they want to make and not having somebody else telling them what they have to do with their lives. All that makes sense? Okay. Um, and also, uh, we provide continued support systems for this um, through our program, which is a big need that um, a lot of these men and women need. So um, what are some of the challenges when it comes to economic empowerment? And this is the number one right here. Criminal records. A lot of these men and women will come out of the life with a criminal record that was imposed on them during their trafficking. And because of that, they're going to have a hard time finding equitable employment as well as independent and safe housing. Because of that, um, they're, they're stuck back in the, the very things that have made them vulnerable in the very first place, right? So um, education for survivors, uh, if, if somebody wanted to go to college, if they have a felony, it's very, very hard for them to get a grant, to get a, uh, a loan, or to um, even get a scholarship. So um, economic empowerment is going to help change this for them. There is a lack of resources when it comes to economic empowerment and resources available out there. Um, there's a lack of continued support systems such as support groups and therapy that is geared towards trafficking survivors. Um, and then funding for economic empowerment programs is very, very lacking right now because this is a gap area. If you look at a lot of other areas within anti-trafficking, there's going to be funding that's specific toward it. But when it comes to economic empowerment, they're just now seeing the importance of it. Okay, so I don't know if this video will play. Will it not? 
Okay, uh, I'm gonna bypass it, but we have a new Economic Empowerment Resource Center that we just opened, it's in Conroe. We opened our doors in July, and I'm gonna share with you a little bit about what we do there. This video was just to show you what it looks like. It's a beautiful place, it's a safe place um, where they can just come and do life with other survivors, um, be around like-minded people. Okay, so again, our doors opened in um, July of 2022. We have survivor-led support groups there. Every single one of our support groups is led by a survivor. Um, we have them all over the nation at this point. We're leading groups online and nationwide. We're leading groups um, in other states. We have them all over the state of Texas. We're getting ready to open one here in the Houston area. Um, we have them in Conroe. We have them in Tomball. I mean, I love that these survivors are stepping up into leadership position in this way because, again, it's just they're getting ready to come together and share life with other people that get where they've been without ever having to explain the nitty-gritty of their trauma. It's a, it's a game changer, I think. Um, we also provide therapy services, trauma-specific EMDR and art therapy, which is accelerated um, resolution therapy. Has anybody ever heard of that? It's brand new for, for sort of with the EMDR, but it's really, really effective. Um, we offer um, tutoring, so anybody who needs a GED, anybody who wants to get a scholarship um, to go to school or go to a certification program, we offer those services. We have a Dignity Boutique, which I wish you guys could see, but it's just a big, beautiful room full of brand new items, essential to everyday items, or brand new clothing, shoes, purses, where they, if they have a job interview or if they have a class. We had a 16-year-old um, child who left her situation with the clothes on her back so we just let her come in and 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 she had school clothes that for the next day which was just neat to see um, we provide um, social enterprises so teaching these men and women how to create their own businesses which a lot of them would not get the opportunity to ever have those resources um, and then and then more so to share with you a little bit about our scholarship program because this is one of our biggest programs that we have um, it does, again, provide educational for GED certification programs in college. We give out $1,500, which may not seem a lot, but if you're going to like Lone Star, that will pay for your tuition and your books most of the time. So a lot of the time, um, we, we give out $1,500 every semester um, to every survivor depending on their need. We give out quite a bit of these every year. Um, we pay for books, we pay for laptops, we give them clothes if they need it. We've provided transportation. I have gone above and beyond sometimes, not me, but my organization to get cars for some of these men and women, which is a whole game changer. Um, just providing them with ways that they may never have had before. And we partner with Lone Star. We're getting ready to part with, partner with Sam Houston State University, which basically is just providing a new program to um, to educate all of the advisors and all the counselors on their campuses so that they can come in and get the extra support. Everybody in this room who's enrolled in school knows how strenuous and stressful that process can be. But for somebody who has survived trauma, they are very well uh, might give up just because it's, it is way, way more than you can ever think stress-wise. So um, just giving that extra support there and just helps navigate them through that system as well as helping them um, with testing and things like that. Um, our survivor-led support groups, we again have nine now um, through the state of Texas, and then I do several across the nation, which I already said. We have now um, one for men that we are starting, and we have a support group for families. As most of you probably understand, um, human trafficking does not just... Um, What's the word? It doesn't just uh, challenge or affect, thank you, whoever said that. It doesn't just affect the person being trafficked. It happens to affect all the families. And you're going to hear from some of them later today, I believe. Um, Survivor-led, again, they're either virtual, in-person, or they're um, hybrid where they can do both. Either one, they can show up in person or they can come online. It's healing-centered instead of trauma-informed, although we are trauma-informed. We are not there to bring up their trauma. That's what a therapist is for. We are there to help them focus on the here and the now and the goals for tomorrow. So we focus on healing. Um, we have monthly trainings for all of our survivor-led leaders, um, and we just continue. Again, we do not pretend to be therapists ever. I think that's um, just one thing we want to get across to people. We're just there to do life with each other. We're, we have become like family in these groups, and we love that aspect. Um, again, our social enterprise program is just here to help um, with men and women with resumes, if they want to learn a certain skill, if they want to start their own business, consultation skills. Um, we do interviewing um, so they can learn how to go in and do interviews. Um, just all of these uh, skills and essential items that they may not otherwise have exposure to that we can now provide for them. 
Again, our Dignity Boutique is open. Um, it's uh, open up all day. It's probably my favorite place in the whole center where they can just come in and, and literally just feel special um, about themselves, feel beautiful and, and move on. Um, do you want to introduce the book? We have the book, When the Silence In. Okay, but um, yeah, we did come out with this book in May, and I, I believe um, Rana is going to share with you a little bit about it was what it is. But it, I will just share that it has 20 different survivor stories in it from across the nation, and throughout the book it has educational skills that goes along. So if somebody was trafficked in pornography, it gives you all of the tools to understand how pornography and human trafficking overlap. So it's a really good educational tool. We love this book. It's getting ready to be go, um, put in the bookstores at Sam Houston as well as Lone Star and across the nation. We're excited. About about it. Um, and then last but la not least, I know I went super fast for you guys, but I know you're going to hear a lot tonight. And um, this is how you can support us. If you're ever in the Conroe area, um, if you have a client that needs economic empowerment, specific needs, please send them our way. If we can't help them, we partner with people like Catherine from 1211 Partners, who also deals with economic empowerment. Um, if we can't do it, we're going to refer to somebody who does. Um, it, there is an assessment process where we go through an application with them, we determine what their needs are, and then we help them get those resources. Um, you can join us by volunteering. It does say that we had our volunteering on uh, October 1st. Our next one is not until January just because of the holidays coming up. But um, our volunteers, every single person that steps foot into our center has to go through four, a four-hour training. That's just uh, non-negotiable to understand exactly um, how to treat these men and women with respect and, and, and trauma-informed as well as healing-centered practices. Um, we do have a wish list that's on our website, um, and, and obviously any nonprofit, especially nowadays, needs help financially. So if you are able to give or if you want to do a fundraiser of some kind or even talk to me about ideas, we, we can use it. Right now, I believe every nonprofit that I know of is struggling financially in every aspect, especially anti-trafficking. Um, and then if you know of educational purposes or events like this, we love to speak. I love to educate. That's what my passion is. I love to tell people my story or share my story because I truly believe that it is the men and women that have been there that's going to stir people to action by sharing. So um, thank you so much again for having me. If you need to get a hold of me, that's my information. And you all have a, a great night. So from listening to Becca, one of the things that I keep picking up on is um, when a survivor builds that self-efficacy, when you're able to have a job, earn your own living, and to be able to make decisions on your own, that really is everything. And so we're going to transition just a little bit from talking about adult victims to child victims. It's kind of a weird transition because I'm actually the speaker now. <laughs> so... so uh, we are going to we are going to talk about CASA Act. That is an anti-child trafficking plan. One of my paid jobs is actually as the anti-child trafficking consultant to Texas CASA. And so we are calling this the ACT program, anti-child trafficking program. Y'all may be more familiar with CSEC or CSE, which is commercial sexual exploitation of children or commercial sexual exploitation of youth. We are calling it the ACT program. We want our CASA volunteers to understand and be very familiar with this phrase. And it builds off of the familiar human trafficking phrase of see something, say something. We are not only talking about sex, child sex trafficking survivors, but also child victims of all forms of sexual exploitation. So CASA acts as a framework, and it's two sides. First, I'm building a program guidebook for CASA programs to engage in the anti-trafficking community to help them understand what the templates and the protocols are. And then I'm also building a volunteer guidebook. This is currently right now, it's about 63 pages. Um, so I love my UHD research methods class. Um, and it covers tips, tools, tricks, resources about what child sex trafficking looks like in the state of Texas and how it intersects with the foster care system. Dallas CASA has a tremendous model. It's called the HRY model. That's where their CASA volunteers are actually specially trained to take only human trafficking cases. So let's talk a little bit if you're unfamiliar with the CASA network. CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates. 
And so our mission is to support local CASA volunteer advocacy programs and to advocate for effective public policy for children and families. Across the state of Texas, there are 72 CASA programs. Some of those CASA programs cover several different counties. This past year, we had 10,920 volunteers in the state of Texas, and we served about 28,543 kids. So how does this happen? The courts appoint a CASA as a guardian ad litem for a child that has been removed and is in the child welfare system. That CASA is responsible for advocating, supporting, and also going to court and making sure that the best interest of that child is taken into consideration. And so what is the intersectionality between foster care and uh, the, fo the foster care system and child exploitation? So we know that for the very reasons that children are removed from their homes also make them vulnerable to sex trafficking. If you think about it, that intersectionality is homelessness, poverty, sexual abuse, physical abuse, and also um, involvement within the juvenile justice center also is very common. When a child runs away from their placement, they automatically are more vulnerable to trafficking. So youth who have been recovered after running away have cited very many, many reasons, the reason why they ran away. Some of them include dislike of the rules, um, anger at the CPS, and rightfully so, a desire to be on one's own, a desire to go find a boyfriend and be with a boyfriend. There are many different reasons. According to the National Foster Care Alliance, they estimated that 60% of kids that have been trafficked are in the foster care system within the child welfare system. And we've seen this number, and we talked about it last night, that 79,000 youth and minors were reported to be sex trafficking survivors within the state of Texas alone. That number was from 2016. We don't know where we are today. And also, it's very important to note that these are reported numbers, right? So you can imagine how many are unreported. This is an extremely low number. And when I say 60% of kids have a history in the child welfare system, um, I work in particular with kids that come from hard places, but 40% is a large number. And that 40% equates to about 31,700 kids that are not in the foster care system. And so that's why it's so important that we make sure that we educate and we bring awareness to all of our communities, not just the kids from hard places. And so we know that it's only through identification and consistent therapy that the scars of child sex trafficking can begin to heal. A survivor leader who was trafficked from the ages of 10 to 17 said that foster care was the training ground to be in trafficked. She understood that she was attached to a check. She also said that her trafficker always told her that he loved her. And that's something her foster parents never did. And I want you to resonate and think about that for a minute. And you wonder why kids run from foster care. So here's what we hope to do at Texas CASA. We want to develop the CASA Act advocacy framework. I've kind of gone over that a little bit. We want to support local programs to get involved in the anti-trafficking community, get involved with the care coordination teams, the multidisciplinary teams. We want to develop best practices for the CIT. CIT stands for Commercially Sexually Exploited Identification Tool. We want our programs to be able to ask, it's a five to seven minute survey, we want to ask all of our kids that are in care from ages 10 and up, not ask questions, but do the survey on them. And so that'll be able to have us be able to identify at an earlier age. We're going to be offering more trainings and more support. We're currently working on a memorandum of understanding with DFPS to engage with human trafficking and kids in care. So there are a lot of stakeholders in this anti-trafficking space. We want to make sure at Texas CASA that we fill a gap, but we don't duplicate services or get in the way. And so let's talk about this program guide. The program guide is how to get engaged in the anti-trafficking community, and we're going to do it in four stages. The first stage is exploration. What does sex trafficking look like in your geographic area? Begin to look and find those communities, those task force, those community awareness teams. Identify who they are. Then you begin the preparation stage continually study human trafficking. Begin to train volunteers. You may choose what Dallas CASA did and have specialized volunteers that only take human trafficking cases. 
You're also going to begin to do the preparatory, prep, preparatory um, stages of doing the SEAT tool. Now we begin implementation. Implementation is where we're going to start providing direct services to kids that are at risk and that who have been trafficked. So what we want to do, I don't know how many of y'all have read the book Upstream, but it's an amazing book. So many times we're putting Band-Aids on the trauma that happens after, after all of this happens to them. What we want to do at Texas CASA is begin to educate kids in the child welfare system starting at the age of 10. And what does it look like at the age of 10? It looks like healthy relationships, boundaries, um, self-esteem types of discussions with children at a very young age. As they get older, these topics will change. So the integration phase is the last one. We know that this is a difficult topic to cover, even for CASA advocates. We want our programs and our volunteers to understand this, to understand what vicarious trauma is, to understand what self-help is, and to make sure that we keep a gauge on how our volunteers are doing as they advocate for kids in care. One of the things we want to do is we want to take our volunteer guidebook, that 63-page book, and we want to create webinars. We want to create in-person training to help un understand all of the different aspects. So what's in the volunteer guidebook? This is a table of contents. I am not going to go over the whole thing. <laughs> but just so you can understand a little bit of what, what we wrote in the book, it gives the foundational information. Um, historical perspective, vulnerabilities, cultural humility, cultural implications. We then move to methodology, right? What are buyers? What are, what are victim? What is victimology? What makes people vulnerable? We then move over to supporting commercially sexually exploited youth. We want our volunteers to understand stages to change, that a child may go back seven times before they finally leave, that there is no bullet you know, some quick fix in that you're going, to be, you're going to be faced with anger because these kids have been let down by every single person in their life, and it's your responsibility to build rapport with them. And I couldn't, we all know, um, almost all human trafficking information comes out in January. January is the National Human Trafficking Awareness Month. And here at Texas CASA, we have something called the Red Sand Project. This is what it looks like. This was a national campaign that was created by Molly Gokman. And what she did is she wanted red sand to be put in the cracks of streets and sidewalks to open up a dialogue, to have people talk about this. What is this red sand here? Let's talk about human trafficking. Let's talk about the vulnerabilities. And here's the logic that Molly had. So many times, victims of sex trafficking fall through the cracks. They're not seen. And so this is an opportunity for us to do this. And so we want all of y'all to do the same thing. And so how do you do it? You pick a date, pick a time, pick a location, and you fill in red sand in the cracks. And then what you're going to do is get creative. You can do a video. You can do a photograph. You can hold up signs, say whatever you want. Um, what we want you to do is take those images, take those photos. And in January, National Human Trafficking Month, we want you to post them on social media. Hashtag CASA Acts and hashtag, text, uh, hashtag Red Sand Project. We want you to then take those images and the photos and send it to CASA Acts at TexasCASA.org. That's me. And so what Texas CASA is going to do is we're going to take all of these images and videos and we're going to compile them together. Then we're going to push them out across the entire state of Texas. I personally would love to see Houston and Fort Bend County to be the two biggest areas that we cover whenever we get all this red sand project. So that deadline is actually January 12th. And so we just got approval in Fort Bend County to go to the Justice Center, the Fort Bend County Justice Center, and cover the entire entrance and the sidewalk down to the parking garage in red sand. So that's what we're going to be doing the first week in January. So at Texas CASA, we have something called the CASA Way. We have an uncompromising belief that we will achieve what others think is impossible. And each of us is essential in the process. Here is my contact information. Um, and just so everybody knows, this whole presentation will be on YouTube in about a week. So if you miss any of these slides of contact information, you can also find it online at the UHD YouTube channel. Thank you. Now I'm going back to the other role. OK. <laughs> so I have the utmost pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Judith Harris.
She is an associate professor here at the Department of Criminal Justice at the University of Houston downtown. She specializes in reentry and recovery for those with or without criminal convictions. She has a senior seminar class, which is a service learning opportunity, specifically with students working with inmate populations at the Harris County Sheriff's Office Jail, and also students are also involved with the Harris County Constable's Office Precinct 1 Human Trafficking Division. Dr. Harris is coming up here to introduce you to somebody else, your next speaker. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Friends, new friends, yes. Um, I'm not going to introduce Catherine. I'm going to have one of our students introduce her um, because I think it's important that the human trafficking class is totally integrated into what we're doing here this evening. So Francesca, if you could come up. Good evening, everyone. Let me just start out by saying I had no idea what to expect when I decided to take Dr. Harris's human trafficking course. And I came to realize there was much more to learn this after attending a couple of Catherine's group meetings. It speaks to her perseverance to learn how far she's come, to learn where she's been and how far she's come. Instead of focusing on herself, she's paying it forward by assisting others. This entails trying to prevent folks from going down that road, and if they find themselves traveling along that path to get them back on track. She's passionate about raising awareness, such as speaking here tonight. So I urge you all to clear your minds and take heed, because someone you know, someone you love, someone you may have no ties to, could be in this very situation, and that someone could be you. On behalf of this semester's CJ4316 class, it is my privilege to introduce you all to Ms. Catherine Griffin. Good evening. Good evening. First of all, I want to say thank you again. Rhonda, you went above and beyond and over the hill and round the bend. <laughs> but you did it. I want to thank Dr. Judith Harris for working with me for several years when I first started the first prostitution sex industry rehabilitation program in the Harris County Jail, which was the first program of its kind anywhere in any jail in the world. And we're still at it. I want, real quick, to give acknowledgement to the We Been There, Done That people. Where you at? <laughs> these are serious. They're not all, these are not only survivors, but they're thrivers. They're overcomers. They're women with dignity and self respect today. And then, of course, last but not least, the human trafficking class. Yay, here at University of Houston downtown. Sex trauma. And increased vulnerability for future exploitation. Sound like a lot of big old words, don't it, girls? The problem is individuals, not all of them, but a very large population. And then come November 14th, it'll be 20 years that I've worked with my, our type of people who have gone through prostitution, sex trafficking, drug abuse, domestic violence, financial abuse, emotional, psychological abuse. And up to this point, all over this world, I probably work with one point something million individuals. All the while, 
I'm recovering from my traumas. And I couldn't understand why so many individuals who did not self-identify their victim status are those secrets that keep us all sick and those things that we didn't want God or Satan to know, but if they are who, they, who we believe they are, they already do it. And being able to walk in our own truth, because first of all, the sex trauma, especially with minors, my research and my personal experience in working with so many including the youngest child I ever rescued off the strip pole here in Houston, was nine. The fact that somebody in Harris County would allow a nine-year-old to work in a strip club, I'm still stuck on that and why nothing has been done about that. But the people that for years that speak to some of us, who are contemplating wanting another way, but a lot of us have had to do so many strange things for a piece of change, just to eat, lay, sleep, survive, wash your body. The unspeakable task that were either forced upon us or coerced through financial game, even a sandwich, our cigarette, our bottle of water, even to use the bathroom. A lot of people don't think about those obstacles. And then when people talk with a lot of us, they use words so big, and us, being proud women and men and transgender and other, don't want to tell you, I don't know what economic means. I know it might have something to do with money. Just a quick observation. We're missing an entire population because we forget everybody is not as highly sophisticatedly, that might not even be a word, but I used it today, <laughs> realized we don't understand what some of these abbreviations are. We don't understand some of the words that seem to be basic. Some of the terminologies when all I know is I was in foster care and every foster care home I went to, they were molesting me. And people are talking to me and they're giving me, which is needed, hygiene packs, Bibles, some clothes, but you're still covering me up because I'm still a messed up garbage can inside. This sexual trauma made me think sex made me an adult. That's why it's so hard for a lot of individuals to get out. Because now sex has been associated with money, clothes, designer bags, red bottoms, almonds and diamonds and things. Things that impressed me and some of those things lured me away from where I was because it is a known fact, you correct. Children run away from something, but they might not tell you what the real something actually is. Because a lot of children that are in foster care run away because they either want to know where they came from eventually, why they don't want me, and here's somebody, man, woman, other, boy, girl, telling me 
how much they love me and don't nobody else understand me. So hell, I'm finna go with them. It's better than where I came from. So I thought. And the increased vulnerabilities. Why, how are so many being trapped and caught up? We all, parents, grandparents, young people, it don't matter. This thing right here was invented for something supposed to be positive. And this has been one of the darkest weapons used in stripping us of everything that we said, or even as a child, if you did have a dream, what you want to be, what you might can be, what you can and can't be, and where you want to go and how you want to get there. Y'all have to forgive me, I'm a little under the weather I just had major shoulder surgery and another internal surgery, so I'm two weeks out with stitches. So I'm, I'm doing the best I can today. But I'm saying that because being a survivor and a thriver and an overcomer, don't matter if I had surgery yesterday. When we're talking about something like this, that's where that survivor instinct kicks in. I don't care where it is. If you, you gotta, if you get out, you got to be taught and practice how to throw the rope back to pull somebody else out the way they need to be pulled out. Cookie cutter wellness treatment plans don't work for everybody. How many of y'all ate the pizza today? It was good, wasn't it? Raise your hand if you ate pizza. Y'all ate it? Did you offer me some? No, 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 young man. Did you offer me any? I'm glad you didn't because I'm highly allergic to cheese. If I had eaten it, I'd have stopped breathing. So what's right for you? could be totally wrong for me. And so be it when it comes down to the individuals that you are willing to work with to help them overcome their traumas, their fears, their experiences, their darkness. And even in their dark times were some good times. Every day in the life wasn't always bad. Especially when you hit a lick. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And believe it or not, the majority of the individuals that really won't help are not walking around with the po me story. po me po me Let me tell you what happened to me. po me Which starts you to pour them another drink, pour them another dope sack, Pour them some more unhappiness. When working with individuals, let them talk. Because first of all, I'll just use me. The 22 years <clears throat> I was in the life, who would ever thought somebody that was in the life would come on, put on a badge, work for the police. <laughs> ah, amazing. Ah, amazing. But being able to talk openly and trusting that individual and being able to, people say, oh, forgive, okay? How many people know the word forgive? Raise your hand. Now, how many people actually know how to forgive? How do you forgive, pretty lady, in the cute outfit I told you about today? <laughs> but how do you forgive yourself? Want me to tell you? Want me to tell you? Practice. <laughs> because you're going to make some mistakes. Because a lot of us don't even realize, first of all, that we need to forgive us because we're looking at... Look what they did to me. Why did this happen to me? If there was a God, why would somebody rape me when I was two? Why would my mama leave me on the delivery table? 
I'm talking about mine. Now, I, it doesn't matter why she left me on the delivery table. It doesn't matter anymore. It was 1959, 60. She was white. My father was black. She couldn't keep no black baby. She did the best thing in the world. At least she didn't flush me. I'm grateful that she had enough because had she not left me on that table, I wouldn't be standing here in front of y'all with this old broken wing. Today, we're so quick to be angry before practicing and understanding what our truth is because if you were high on anything, your past, what you think your truths are, might not even be the truth. Because we might not even remember. And then in the life we were, we had to, as a protection mechanism, we had to believe our own lies just to survive. So I could tell you anything, and it could be just as wrong. So it takes time. And in order to have true healing, you have to have the recipe that works for you as an individual. It's important. I have not met a lot of women in the sex industry who, that even the ones that identify as prostitutes or ex-prostitutes that will tell you right now they enjoy sexual intercourse. It was a survival for a lot. And with that brought a lot of shame. And it destroyed our ranks of woman, man, trans, other, mother, father, sister, brother, grandparent, aunt, uncle, and friend. All of those are very important ranks. And what I understand, those ranks could have and bring great privileges. So it's time for all of us to take it down a few notches if you're really serious about learning the different personalities of an individual who has been sexually traumatized. I know what it is to be put in a cage, fed dog food, and all my bones broken. They didn't break this, but I asked them, how did this to totally torn rotator cuff happen? And they said, through just wear and tear through the years. And I had to think about that. In the life, getting out the life, lifting stuff, trying to help throw the rope back. I just want everybody to understand what you all do, what you all do, what you all do, what I do, what you, the universities do is important. It's time to stop separating all of us and everybody come to the table and talk. If you don't understand something being said, don't be ashamed. Say, I don't understand. All I know is I'm hurting and I need some help. I need some help. You can start right there. I'm the founder of We've Been There, Done That. It's a peer-to-peer, -peer, trauma informed IOP, intensive outpatient group. And I'm the founder of Our Roadway to Freedom in the Texas Department of Corrections. We identify the women in all of the female prisons in the state and some out of the state, and they send them down to the Plain State Prison in Dayton, Texas to my program. I have a full staff there, and it is amazing because when they come in, a lot of them don't even, they don't identify because they have other charges. And, Nobody even talked to them about any kind of sexual exploitation or any of those things. And unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of women that are ended up getting uh, compelling prostitution cases were forced by the real pimp to go and recruit or they could be killed or starved or given a 24, 48, 72.
How many people know what those numbers mean? Okay, I'll tell you. That pimp will make that person walk on the whole stroll, is what they call it, prostitution stroll. For 24 hours, no food, no water, no nothing, just work until you make your quota. You disobey again, you can get a 48 hour. You gotta be out there two days. And if you're caught, somebody feeding you, they can take your life. And the most severe is the 72. Imagine those children who have to go out there and do that. And when church groups and stuff come to try to bring them goodie bags, if you take it, they go get beat within an inch of their life if they're being trafficked and pimped out. A lot of things people don't know. Let me tell you how I got messed over, but I was only trying to help. That's a real statement. So I want to just tell you all, I really, truly appreciate all of you all coming. You're welcome. Um, can the class stand up? My class, my, my group, some of them. Can y'all give them a round of applause? Come to 1302 Preston on Wednesdays at 1 o'clock. Here's some of the real stories. Come into my prison. I have 127 in the program as of today. And it, of course it varies. Sometimes it's more, but we're trying to keep it limited because of the pandemic and all of that. But I have a whole building there. The very prison I did my time in. And it's so amazing because I always went to jail for having an empty crack pipe <laughs> and getting in the car with the undercover. <laughs> that meant I didn't have no dope if I was on the street because I was trying to get some. And I thought I was getting in the car with somebody who was fixing to fill up my pipe. And the last time I got arrested, they offered me 33 years day for day. And then I look at what's happening today. People are multiple bonds. Murder, aggravated robbery, everything. They were, I wouldn't even have no record. If I was getting in trouble today compared to back in my day, three strikes you out, I never killed nobody. I didn't break in your house. I didn't, I wasn't even, I didn't even have the courage to be a Walmartian. That's where you go in Walmart and steal. <laughs> I would, now I would go in there and eat the grapes if I was starving. <laughs> So I just want to say thank you for the opportunity, Rhonda, Professor, Dr. Harris, for you all allowing me to spend this time with you all today. And just open your eyes. And when we speak to people, keep it as simple as you can. Try not to go over a fourth grade level, maybe, because you probably have the key to turn the light switch on on somebody that really needs your expertise. We just have to remember who we're talking to without judgment because we all bleed red. May God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. I love you. Wow, I've got to follow that. <laughs> And I think I did get caught shoplifting at Walmart, just to let y'all know. <laughs> um, when you meet Katherine Griffin, you never forget her. Her legacy is unbelievable, and I'm trying to say this without getting emotional. Um, when you think of how many lives she has affected, um, not only the women and the men that she works directly with, but their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, we will never know the generational legacy that she has left in the work that she has done. And I literally say, have goosebumps saying that out loud. I love you, Rhonda. Thank you. Love you too. Um, we're going to switch here. It's kind of, we're going to, we're going to talk to the suits over here. <laughs> so um, I, I have a tremendous relationship with the Fort Bend County District Attorney's Office. I chair their human trafficking community uh, awareness team. I lovingly call these two Wonder Woman and Superman because they are. 
Um, we cannot talk about meeting the needs of survivors without talking about the work of prosecuting traffickers and buyers. And so uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Craig Priestmeyer and Ashley Harkness. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Ashley Harkness. And Craig Priestmeyer. Um, you know, we don't often come out and we do these conversations. And in fact, when Ashley and I took the job as prosecutors at the Fort Bend DA's office, it wasn't an item on the line of things that we'd have responsibility for to come and do these talks. But since Ashley and I have been a part of the Human Trafficking Division, this was one of the things we absolutely wanted to do. Because it's talks like this with survivors and other advocates and individuals in this line of work that educate the community, right? If you think back 50 years, how did we look at domestic violence? How far have we come in 50 years in how we look at situations like domestic violence? And it's been, what, five, six, seven years that human trafficking has really been talked about? And so we find it to be an honor to come up and have these kind of conversations like this. And what we're going to talk about is about the justice system. And we're not going to shy away from the fact that a lot of people have a distrust in it. And what we're here to do is to try and give you just a glimpse of what it looks like when a victim comes in, how many people they've talked to before they even sit down in our office, and the question that we ask on um, what does justice look like to you? What do you want to see happen in this case? And so... Let's hope that we can talk about a couple of things, some things that Ashley and I have both seen in cases in Fort Bend County since our office has taken a priority and Brian Middleton has taken a priority. Um, but we'll go ahead and just kick it off. And the common question that we always hear when we go out and we talk to the community is what is sex trafficking? And we always get this. It's like the movies. It's like Liam Neeson. It's like getting on the phone and saying, I'm going to find you. I'm going to hunt you down. And we always have to talk about the reality. And I think it's important to point out that this kind of misconception of what is human trafficking is everywhere. I was meeting with a misdemeanor prosecutor. He's probably been a lawyer for six months today. And he was trying to explain how he was going to try his sex buyer case and how he was going to explain sex trafficking. And I caught him talking about, you know, we don't want them. We want them to be scared of their, their kids getting snatched off the street. And I thought, you know, we have to, that's not what it is. We have to slow down. Let's have a talk about what are we really seeing. When you want the community to be scared of human trafficking, we want them to be scared of what the reality is. Right. Um, and so what the reality is, is these are the, the cases that we prosecute. We have the trafficking of persons, which is our overarching law that we follow. And then we have all these other charges that kind of fall under the umbrella of trafficking, the promotion of prostitution, aggravated promotion, online promotion, compelling prostitution, sexual performance by a child, and that's not even including sexual assault, right. aggravated sexual assault, and all the other charges that can come from those. And I'm glad Ms. Griffin brought it up. Compelling prostitution, a charge that we often see and we put on to traffickers that come in, and that's causing by force, fraud, or coercion, someone to commit prostitution. Right. As simple as that. It's a first degree felony in the state of Texas. If someone's charged with it, it's five to 99 or That's life. Right. That's right. It's one of the highest offenses that we can charge a person outside of continuous trafficking, which is a minimum 25 day for day up to life in prison. We use every single one of these offenses when we look at a case to see for probable cause. If a victim comes in and they're comfortable enough to tell us their experience and what they've had to go through, our law allows us to charge multiple offenses, and what we look at is we will. Mm -hmm. We'll put on as many as possible so that our judges, so that our community won't give out easy bonds, won't people Man. let them out and keep them in Ooh. until they can meet their day in court and face the accusers that they have. And again, the reality, this is the definition that we go under when we consider what has our legislature told us is trafficking. And that can be just transportation, enticement, recruitment, harbor, provide, or otherwise obtain another person by any means. And so what we see in Fort Bend County, um, a lot of times, we don't, we don't have a bisonette. We don't have an open air track where it's happening, or at least not one that we know of yet. 
Um, but we do have is traffickers who live in Fort Bend County. They might rent a house in Sugar Land. They might use the hotels up and down 59 in Stafford and Missouri City. And so we're seeing the transportation, the harboring, the providing, um, or maybe that's where they're recruiting them. Maybe they're reaching out to people who live in Fort Bend County and then taking them across county lines to somewhere where there is open air prostitution. Yeah, and even though it's not in Fort Bend, it's not that far away. We talk about what it looks like to prove between juveniles and adults and what the law tells us we have to show. And for anyone under the age of 18 who's a victim of trafficking, we just merely have to show that they have caused them to become a victim of. And we have dot, dot, dot there because the law says it could be multiple different offenses. A victim of prostitution, a victim of compelling prostitution, a victim of child pornography possession or promotion. If a person has caused a child to become that, we can charge them with trafficking of a child under 18, a first degree felony. And if it's an adult, we just merely have to show force, fraud, or coercion. And that's a broad definition. Coercive, we've heard a couple of things tonight about coercion can come in the form of, I'm not going to give you some basic necessity unless you make my quota, my quarter. My thousand dollars tonight or otherwise. The force that comes with that, and it is what it sounds like. Physical assault, threats of assault. Um, and then as something, you know, for our individuals who are undocumented, withholding those documentations until they make the money that they are required to make when they come over. We've seen some of those as well. This is a little update in the law from the legislation last year, September 1st of 2021. Uh, the no trafficking zone went into uh, legislation and what that basically says is if any of the trafficking compelling prostitution any of that is happening on school grounds we're talking primary secondary your elementary junior high high school um, your punishment range ups uh, 25 to life is what you're looking at if we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the trafficking was taking place on one of those locations and it's not just in the school we're not talking about they've come to the school to get you it could be um, at sports events, at the stadiums, maybe where a band concert's happening. It could be you're in school and this person is messaging you while you're in school. Right. Um, that's where they're finding you. Mm -hmm. Another law update, and I think it's one that both Ashley and I are proud to say, is that the state of Texas is the only state in the United States that has made sex buying a felony. Ah, love it. It's a state jail felony as of September 1st of 2021. And the last that we checked, Ashley and I, mm -hmm. how many different cases have we filed since then? We currently have 125 pending felony sex buyer cases. That's not including ones that have already pled or are currently kind of going through our grand jury system. And that's in a calendar year. Wow. Just to highlight some of the information that we come from this. Um, does anyone remember the big freeze that happened last year? Yeah. yeah? yeah. Remember that? Right? Yeah. At February time, yeah. we had a three-day proactive operation that was aimed at identifying and arresting sex buyers. In three days, we arrested 30. It was the weekend before that freeze. 30 individuals between the hours of 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. coming to purchase sex from a person. And that's just to highlight the type of demand that's out there and why our law enforcement officers are doing those types of operations. Um, and this is reality. I show you photographs up here from the Bissonette Street, from the blade as it's called. That's the reality of trafficking. And you'll see in the bottom, as Ms. Griffin pointed out, who's got a phone? Let me see those, right? Just as you see in the bottom left, you know, I, I always kind of say this and in, in half jestly, but in 2008, UGK told us exactly what was happening. Uh -huh. <laughs> what do you say? Pimp and eight dead. Yeah. It just moved to the web. <laughs> but that's why we put it up there because the trend that we've seen on here is because whether it's a website, back page, LA escort out, I mean, different websites that are used to post an individual, a human for purchase. Yep. And we see a lot of that. A lot of our cases that we have investigations on. And I'll tell you, our office has dedicated their investigative division and prosecution to a more digital evidence-focused, evidence-based right. prosecution. Right. Because we've heard already, 
Our victims are not always wanting to cooperate. They're not ready yet to identify as a victim. They're not wanting to come in and go through the scary process of sitting down with Ashley and I and talking about having to testify in court under oath about all the heinous things that have happened to them. That's right. I bring that up to say when we build a case up, we look to try and remove the need for a victim, whether it's through Instagram records, social media accounts, text messages, so we can make it easier on victims overall, but still hold traffickers accountable and get that justice. So these are the tools of the trade now. <clears throat> like Craig said, it's the cell phones, it's the laptops, um, it's your social media, anything that you can use to send a message to another person on the internet. Um, we have done countless search warrants, almost every case that uh, where we arrest a trafficker, we're going to do search warrants for phone, their social media. It's a, just a one after another. One thing leads to another. Um, and you'll see later on in this, we've identified um, several people <clears throat> on social media. We found their, their profiles, and we have some examples of the things that we pulled from them. We won't identify them themselves. It's the saying that I keep hearing um, sometimes about phones, right? You give someone a phone, you give your kid a phone. Um, and you're giving your kid access to the World Wide Web, right? Right. Yeah. Well, what are you also doing? You're giving the World Wide Web access to the child. Yeah. Access to you. That's right. Access to everything that's on there. And the that's man. oftentimes through these. So a lot of times, yeah, we, we used to have a slot on here where it was a quiz, right? You could go through and you could tell us what each one is. But, you know, people have become very familiar with these because they're popular. Right. Popular apps generally attract anything that you can get. I think there's one that y'all are questioning, right? Yeah. That's OnlyFans. Oh. And that, and that is something that we're seeing traffickers use as another way to get money. Maybe we're not, I'm not ready to, to put you out yet, but you can make some videos. You put some photos, we'll get some money that way. A couple of articles just to highlight how some of the applications that we commonly use are also used to further trafficking, to victimize individuals. Facebook was seen here, a couple of different places. Instagram being used through direct messaging to reach out to somebody else, to comment, compliment, to give a couple of likes, hearts, get some attention. Uh, an entire podcast um, on the use of Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp <coughs> being used. Here in the state of Texas, OnlyFans as well, just like Ashley mentioned, is oftentimes in a lot of our cases we see being used for supplemental income. And I say supplemental income because to our traffickers, they look at their victims as a commodity right. to make them money. And whether it's through OnlyFans, whether it's through the street, whether it's through ads, that's the name of the game. But it's just my boyfriend. So we talk about TikTok. Who has TikTok? Is on it. Maybe don't make videos. I watch TikTok. I don't make videos. Um, I was curious. A year ago, I put in some hashtags to search, see if I could find anything in the Houston area. I didn't find much. This was just a few months ago. I put in some hashtags, and this is what I found. Um, I didn't block that guy out in the far left. He's a pimp himself, or he fancies himself one. He posts videos. Just suggestions, how to do it, what he thinks is the way to do it. Um, and these were two women who I found were posting from the Houston area, um, showing the money they made. And we have some other ones later on. Um, it's everywhere. Um, and it's getting more popular and we're finding it even in TikTok. And the use of the vernacular, too. I mean, you'll see it up there, the blue P, right? And when we first started looking at these cases, we didn't know what half this stuff meant. Um, we'll talk about it in a second kind of what we've seen trending. Some other different um, applications that we've definitely seen come through um, between Twitter, Discord, Snapchat, and certainly TextNow. To anyone who's not familiar with TextNow, it's an application where you can generate a spoof number other than the one tied to your phone. Mm -hmm. um, then there's the financial apps. Your Cash App, your Venmo, your Apple Pay, even Snapchat has a way of sending money between individuals. Um, Google Pay, extremely popular in this 
day and age to be able to transfer money back and forth. This was a, a screenshot of an Apple Pay um, of a woman whose phone we had taken after we had identified her trafficker. Um, in her phone, we found the money coming in from a sex buyer and then that money going right out to her trafficker with his name on it. Um, and this is just something that we use. It's great evidence for us. Um, if And when we go to trial, if she is not ready to come forward, we have this instead to show um, that money was going exactly to him. A couple of different things, ah. right? So we've seen these. We pull these screenshots from known trafficking Instagram accounts. Things that are put out there to kind of highlight what this idea is, right? The word respect. How a trafficker is trying to take that word and make it into something that's what? Honorable? Um, the things that we're going to be talking about here coming up are, are pretty sensitive. I mean, they're hard words to, that are used to describe individuals. Um, for instance, we saw this. And I know at first blush, a lot of you look at this number and you have no idea maybe what this is. We started seeing it quite a bit. We started seeing it in usernames. Instagram handles, <clears throat> how they refer to themselves. Um, we had someone we knew to be a trafficker approach an undercover officer and tell that officer, I'm a true 16. What's the 16th letter out that? <laughs> it's highlighted because this is a really common way that our traffickers talk to each other. You saw it earlier, that blue P. Messages between individuals saying, hey, P, hey, 16. There's entire clothing companies now that are sold right here in Houston that emblazon the 16 on the, you know, Letterman style jacket that's called it's Temporelli. Called Pimparelli. They, have, they sell varsity, Pimparelli. your varsity jackets. It'll say Pimparelli down the side with the 16 on the front mm -hmm. and some other stuff on it as well. And we've seen it twice come up oh, in traffickers. <laughs> Heard this one? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and the first time we heard this, we thought, oh, no, that's, that's corny. That's that, no around. way. That's <laughs> and it's still around. Yeah. It still is. Because when you flip it upside down, right, that's the reference. That's the reference. Um, it, and we don't put this up lightly. This isn't some kind of joke or game. But at the end of the day, when you saw that screenshot earlier, Right When you see some of these words being used in the messages, in the Instagram posts, it's glorifying the idea that you're a 304, you're a hardworking girl, that you're going to make him a lot of money. Him sometimes being referred to as daddy. You'll see in some of the screenshots that we've taken here, um, some of the common ideas that are put around. Um, up at the top left, you'll see that that was a message taken from an Instagram account calling himself a true 16, I want to appreciate the good hoeing you got going. Choose up or break yourself. One of the common vernaculars that we've heard between choosing up when you move from one trafficker <coughs> to another. And what oftentimes when we have a victim come in and talk about that process of their third or fourth choosing, that quota that's required up at the front end, that payment that's required up front, you need to bring me $5,000 if you want to join up with my group. The, the guy who sent those two messages on the top left, in the blue, this is from um, him as well. We found this saved in his notes section. He would just copy, paste, copy, paste. He sent this to probably 50 different women in, on Instagram, just seeing who he'd get to respond back to him. And what you'll see, if you've had a chance to read through it, is you'll see a lot of references to things like kingdoms or yeah. goddess or loyalty, royalty, <clears throat> using crown emojis and high heel stilettos and things like that to show that this is glamorous. I'm going to elevate you to a status. The use of those emojis we see in a lot of ads that are put on as well, right? Like the roses to indicate dollars, the amount of money that is being put in. You know, these are ads that we find online, but oftentimes it's the trafficker who's writing these. And later on, we've heard them brag about how they've come up with clever words and phrases and things like that that they put into their ads to try and attract sex buyers. Yeah, they put in the things like the, <clears throat> the roses. They think that we don't know what the roses mean. If they get somebody to agree to pay 100 roses, that we can't prosecute them because we don't understand that that means dollars. 
Um, so this is just something that's helpful for us to understand when we're reviewing evidence so we know what they're talking about. So this is what I talked about TikTok. This is what I put in. I put in the hashtag 304, and then I also put in Houston. But these are, these are things that pop up. These are probably a couple of months old now. Um, but Bissonnette, you see that guy in the middle? I need a 304 laid out in his cache. Um, it's out there. And so anything that can have social media, any device that has social media, you can get to anything like this. A lot of what we brought up today was just for identification, right? It's trends that we see. It's things that we see when cases come in, when our task force brings in charges, when we get back social media returns. Um, and I'll tell you one thing that's been extremely, extremely important in the last couple of months, months, is our community members. Um, doing these talks, I think, has paid out dividends in the amount of members of our community who, when they see something, they do say something. We've had cases that are open right now and being investigated because a neighbor just saw something that was off. Mm -hmm. Too many cars coming and going from a house dropped a call, put in a tip, and after some surveillance on the property, turned out to be a multi-state trafficking ring with girls being moved from Vegas to Los Angeles to Miami to Houston with a home base being right in Fort Bend County. Right. It's a highly sophisticated operation that we never would have known about. You wouldn't have found it on your usual ad space. Uh, we never would have known about it but for these, these nosy neighbors that made a call and it was investigated. So we put this up there because we hope that if for nothing else, maybe you do come across something one day that's just a little off or just something. I never want to discourage, and Ashley, you know, as well, never want to discourage anyone from just calling and making that report. If it doesn't turn into anything today, you never know in a week or a month if that could have broken a huge case open to rescue or to bring some sort of justice to someone who's being victimized. Again, we put in the CPS because if it's a child, we all have that duty if we believe that a child's being physically or sexually abused to make that report. Because for law enforcement, they get filled in on those referrals immediately. And I believe that that's it. I appreciate again all of your time. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your. Thank you. So um, one update I wanted to give on the no trafficking zone, that is a state law that was just passed this past legislative session. It's actually working its way through the federal government right now to become a national law and applicable to all states in the United States. It has made it through uh, the House and it's over in the Senate, and we are hoping that the No Trafficking Zone, which is a local organization that will be here tomorrow, um, is working on that bill. Thank you so much, Craig and Ashley. We're about to start a portion now where I talked about, we talk about academics, right? But you're about to hear the lived experience story of three incredible women. And I'm going to read the first bio for Miss Lana Turner, and then she will come up here and take over. Lana Turner is a mother of two, a grandmother, a career paralegal, cancer survivor, and national advocate for sexual assault and human trafficking survivors. She is the author of Back to Beautiful, a memoir of experiences as a parent survivor of human trafficking attacks within her own family. Lana serves as a, mem a mentor, consultant, advisor, and public speaker for nonprofit organizations and victims' rights groups. She also supports local, state, and national leaders heading human trafficking task force in their mission to improve policy and protect victims from re-exploitation and criminalization. She is personally driven by the desire to reduce the risk of human trafficking by raising awareness in communities, both large and small, and for individuals impacted by human trafficking to know that their life has purpose and their voices deserve to be heard. Welcome, Lana Turner. If you are out to describe the truth, leave elegance to the tailor. 
That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you the ugly truth today. It's not pretty. It's not elegant. Shh. Someone might hear you, he said. Shh. That was the last sign I heard before someone I knew and trusted raped me. I was 15 years old, old enough to attend the pool party where my rape occurred, but too young to understand that rapists come from every nook and cranny of life, even churches. My name is Lana Turner. I'm a survivor of sexual assault and an advocate for survivors like me, the ones who you never hear about, the ones who stay silent and quiet because of fear and shame. We are the stories behind the stats or the humanity behind the most inhumane crime committed. You rarely hear about our stories because most rapes go unreported. We just stay silent. Trauma suppresses our truth and, si and fear silences us. A reality that criminals rely on and a reality that I am dedicating my life to change. You see, I've paid the mental and emotional price of silence. I have lived with shame and regret. I've agonized over allowing my attacker to convince me that there would be no redemption in truth, no recovery in reclaiming the power he took from me, and certainly no honor in divulging the sordid details of his perversion and the way he lured me into the place I once called my crime scene. And he did this with one shh. Someone might hear you. Indicating that if someone heard us, that the shame of this crime was mine, not his. This is just a fraction of the manipulation that rapists use to control their victims. And so we're quiet. With the exception of telling my sister I was quiet for years. I never told anyone, she never told anyone. We never spoke about the most pivotal day of my life. We never told anyone about the crime that had been exacted on my body, my mind, and my spirit. Years later, I was forced to question my silence. It was when my daughter was repeatedly raped by human traffickers. It was 2013, she was 16 years old, I was away at a funeral. I was out of town when my daughter disappeared. When I first got the call saying she was missing, I was thinking, how could this happen to my family? We weren't like the statistics. We were the two-parent home. We were the church-going community. We supported her. We made sure she went to the right school, that she associated with the right people, or at least we thought she did. She was this bright, beautiful, talented young lady who was in dance and cheerleading. My daughter was the all-American girl. She was the polar opposite of what most people think human traffickers live and look like. I'm here to provide a face to this fact. Any of us can become victims of human trafficking. Traffickers are equal opportunity agents of evil. They don't care if you're men, woman, boy, girl, straight, gay, trans, they don't care. I um, was listening to a comedian the other day, and he made this joke that um, he said, I'm so broke, if somebody robbed me, they'd just be practicing. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's me. Um, and then he went on to speak about his family and about his children. And he said, my kids are so bad, if somebody took them, they'd bring them back. And I thought, funny, but wrong. They don't care if your kids, if you or your kids, are bad as hell, if they snot-nosed brats, if they got one tooth or all their teeth how tall they are, how short they are. They do not look at physical attributes. They don't look at zip codes. They don't look at citizenship. They don't look at your family makeup. They don't care if you're from a gated community or from foster care. What they look for 
is opportunity and access. Traffickers do their homework. They plot and they plan on how to gain access to their victims. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter to them if it takes them two years or two months to gain access to their victims. They are strategic and what they want is to make money. That's all they want. My family became associated with human trafficking when a predator gained access to my daughter on social media. Enters Sean. Sean, a 31-year-old man masquerading as a 17-year-old mm. high schooler on his way to college. Sean, while I was away at the funeral, invited my daughter to the mall. When she got to the mall to meet Sean, she was taken. She was taken to San Antonio where she was drugged, raped multiple times, abused, and sold for sex for eight days. And once they were done with her, Sean and his friends, they drugged her. They pumped her with enough drugs to make it look like it was an overdose. Mm. And then they dumped her behind a Walmart. And I remember the day when I was at the police station and I was reunited with her. And I hugged her and her hair reeked of trash because that's where they dumped her. They dumped her by a trash can. My beautiful all-American girl was drugged and dumped behind a trash can. And so when she was returned to me, I started to question myself and the what ifs came to my mind. What if I would have told my daughter about my rape? Would it have made her more socially aware about the evils that are out there? What if I would have known about human trafficking and shared it with her, but instead I, was, I had this false sense of security that my gated community and her nice school district and her good friends and the people at church and everyone was going to protect her. So I never told her. What if the police officer who answered my initial call would have labeled my daughter as a, as, as a missing person or victim? But none of these things happened. I never told her about my rape. And the police officer who came to my house to take my initial report, he said, ma'am, your daughter's a teenager. They run away all the time. Just give it a few days. We usually treat these cases like traffic tickets. So me and my family became the investigators in my daughter's case. We started calling friends. I started looking at her call log. I, we, we did everything we could. And then finally, in the middle of the night, I got a ping on her phone. And it showed an address in San Antonio. That address was a construction site. Shortly thereafter, there showed three 911 calls on her phone. Finally, the police started to take me seriously. And now my runaway daughter slash traffic ticket became a missing person, human trafficking victim. We, um, and after eight days, when she was finally returned to me, <coughs> the police told me that my daughter had been a victim of human trafficking. And I thought to myself, what is human trafficking? I didn't know at the time. What is it? Has this happened to my family? Well, a known predator <coughs> who used to, he was a known predator and a drug dealer. He used to stand outside of high schools and colleges, met her on social media. He used to stand outside of the school and he would pass out flyers and invite young girls to parties. And when they came to the parties, he would drug them, he would rape them, he would sometimes videotape it, and then sell those tapes as pornography. 
So with the help of the police and my family's persistence, they were able to, thank you so much, they were able to arrest, they were able to arrest four men and charge them in my daughter's case. <coughs> thank you. Unfortunately, at the time of his trial, PTSD, anxiety, fear, shame, all of that had set in and she refused to testify. And I was, and the case was dismissed. And I was screaming in my head, like, why won't somebody speak up? And there are so many reasons. I mean, our, our bodies become our crime scene. And then to put what happened to you on display for the public and then have to sit across from this person in a courtroom every day, can you imagine the trauma? We can't do it. We thought we couldn't do it. And so we stay quiet. That's what I did when I was 15. I'm not quiet anymore. I'm not 15 anymore. Now I am a mad as hell mother whose daughter survived eight days of hell. I am a mad as hell mother with a sickening police report etched in my mind. That police report read, I was invited to a birthday party. When I arrived to meet my friend, I was taken to a tattoo place. I was taken to a studio and photographed. I wanted to go home. He threw a drink at me and called me a skinny bitch. He grabbed me by my hair, pulled me out of a shower, and raped me on the bathroom floor. I screamed. He told me he would kill me if I didn't shut the fuck up. He beat and raped another girl in front of me. She was 14. He gave me drugs, he said, to ease the pain. Then he took me to another house. I stopped screaming because I thought I would be killed. Jean branded my daughter like cattle, like farmers brand their cattle so they're not stolen. He photographed her to create a marketing campaign online to sell her body. Eight days of repeated cycle of imprisonment, rape, and abuse was my daughter's reality. And it is the reason why I want you to remember my face. I want you to remember my story. I want you to remember the tremble in my voice. 10 years after this happened, it still hurts. It still scares me. I want you to remember it so you don't know the horror of someone telling you, shh, someone might hear you and you feel like you've done something wrong. I want you to remember this story. Go and talk to your friends. Don't drop this conversation about human trafficking. I thought human trafficking didn't affect my lifestyle, but again, all of us are potential victims. Go tell your family and prevent this from happening again. Thank you for having me. I can tell you after hearing Lana's story, I changed the way I presented to groups. Um, I work with kids that come from hard places. I have my own lived experience. And so it made me understand that we really need to do a better job of making sure that we understand that everyone is vulnerable. Although do we, we do have a higher intersectionality with kids that come from harm places, that 40% is still a whole lot of people. Um, I have the pleasure and the honor of introducing you to Nikki. Nikki Bowie. She is a mother of three who was traumatically educated by the realism of human trafficking happening right here in our right here in our area when she lost her daughter Maddie since losing her she has dedicated any time she can to help educate and support the community to see something and say something Maddie's movement was created in Maddie's honor and is an organization that's dedicated to help fill certain needs of our youth 
and it hosts monthly meetings and events to bring the community together. The more we learn, the stronger we can get against this horrible, horrific organization. Please welcome Nikki Bowie. guys okay um so my story's a little different obviously and um i've shared maddie's story a thousand times and every time i do i feel like i miss something so if i look like i'm just reading i am okay um <laughs> first i want you guys to know that maddie was a beautiful outgoing um beautiful little baby that was born on september 1st there's a significant date that Big things keep happening on September 1st. Y'all, I feel like Maddie has a big to do with that. Um, in 2004, um, she was outgoing. She was energetic. Uh, she was a force to be reckoned with. She didn't take shit from nobody, um, which is baffling to me that we're here today. Um, she loved really hard, and when she um, when she loved somebody, she never she never backed down. She was all in. Um, she dedicated her life to them. She was a family person; like she was ride or die. She was always for me and her brothers. Um, she was like a little mom, you know. I, I went through a divorce, and I worked two jobs, and so Maddie was the. <laughs> she loved helping me because I worked long hours and. I still even have my laundry basket that she wrote all over, boys don't put your stinky socks in here because they didn't realize there was a difference between a dirty hamper and a clean laundry basket, I guess. Um, and so I never realized that I was gonna treasure a freaking laundry basket, you know? Like, I don't match socks, but <laughs> we, keep the, we keep that basket. Um, once she connected with some friends at school, um, it, everything changed for her. Uh, she loved school. She made really great grades. She always made her fr friends there. Um, but once she connected with a few in individuals, everything changed. Her grades started dropping. Um, she did crazy things like they didn't. She didn't want to ride the bus one day, and so they jumped out the back of the moving bus. Um, just really absurd things that she just put herself out there for when she met this group. Um, she didn't. She started not liking the rules of the house, so she started running away um, and staying out with her friends. Um, she did it kind of periodically. So I think that it, we kind of got to the point with the police department where LCPD is incredible, OK? But I think after a while, they're like, she's just a habitual runaway, Nikki. Like, she's going to come back. You know she is. But in my mama heart, you know that eventually, someday, you're going to get that phone call. And I never wanted it, but I knew that like if I didn't get her home and I could, couldn't keep her safe myself, that unfortunately, this is where we're going to be. Um, Manny, uh, Maddie ran away and uh, she was missing for a few days. So of course we reported it to the police like we always did. And like I said, they just kind of took the report, said call us when she gets home. Like this was like an everyday thing, it wasn't every day, but it was, it was pretty common, okay? Um, but just like, uh, you know, Lana said, it was just kind of like a check off that box. I did what I had to do. I, 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 now I'm gonna just go to the next call, right? Like. They saw my address, they're like, oh, it's the Bowie family again, type thing, you know? So what? they didn't feel like it was a big deal. Um, so she was missing for a few days, and that's the hardest thing, because like normally she would just come back, and she didn't. And um, we shared an iCloud account, and eventually her text messages started coming through on my device. And so of course, I immediately went back to the, the police department, and I was like, look, that you know, let's, She's, let's look up these people. They're bad people. I, I don't have these numbers in my phone. Um, and they were like, well, there's no, like, sign of any exploitation. There's no, like, it was just like, hey, baby, what are you doing? She's 15 years old. No boy should be talking to my daughter like that. But anyways, um, so I literally had to go home and just watch those text messages. But just like Lana did, I got on the internet and I Googled every freaking phone number. And you guys can find a lot of information about somebody from their phone number. I found social media pages. I found that these were married men with beautiful families, gorgeous wives, awesome families. They were successful. You know, they made money. They drove expensive cars. I mean, like, not the typical, like, what you would think a trafficker looks like, right? And so... Um, I printed everything out. I literally had to go buy more ink because I ran out of it and I took it back to them and I was like, now do something. And still we had nothing. 
we didn't know where she was at. Still, like, we didn't have the connection from the text messages. Like, it just, it was still just my mama heart being crazy and kind of how they made me feel. Um, so finally, just randomly, her location popped up on my phone. And um, so, of course, I went right back to the police station, and it was out of their jurisdiction. So I wasn't super educated on human trafficking. I've seen that it's in different countries. but it, So I was aware that it's something that happens, right? Um, so they were like, well, we're just going to call, you know, Webster PD and, and say that she's there. I'm like, are you serious? I'll probably never see my daughter again. Either A, she's going to run away or they're going to take her. So LCPD was incredible. They created a little task force, if you will, and they literally sat outside the house that she was at until she came out. Um, they followed the car. They pulled her over. Um, the other two girls that were in the car were minors, so I don't know what happened after that, but I was told that we did rescue two other girls in that stop. Um, so we rescued Maddie. Um, we sent her to um, a housing facility, which some of y'all might have heard um, about some things that happened out in Austin, um, the refuge. And it was an incredible facility, you guys. I was baffled when I heard all these things um, because these people really, really helped Maddie. Um, unfortunately, though, there were a couple of things that happened there. And now I feel confident that I can share what happened. She was assaulted by a, um, another victim there. And um, Maddie was always the, I don't trust police. Um, I don't take shit from nobody. So if you put your hands on me, we about to go down, right? And so this one time, this girl knocks her in the back of the head, and Maddie just lays on the ground, and she says, get her off me, get her off me. Staff gets her off, and she decides that she wants to press charges. I was so proud of her, you guys. I felt like we were in this process of finally finding my daughter again and getting her back. Unfortunately, a law enforcement there was not very um, helpful. Um, they pretty much told me that there were all these loops that we had to um, go through because she was um, not in my care. She was in their care, and then that that child's um, family wasn't involved. So long story short, I pretty much gave them an ultimatum, and I was like, either Maddie stays or that other girl stays. And that was a really hard thing for me to say because every victim deserves their chance. And, um, and they chose to let Maddie stay, and I was super grateful for that. Um, it might have been 30 days, um, and Maddie got her first visit. Um, I went up there every weekend, y'all. I put like five trillion miles on my car, but who cares? That's what moms do, right? And um, we took her off the property. We enjoyed uh, Mexican food. She loves Mexican food, and uh, she got to spend some time with her brothers. And when we came back, they always did a search of my car. They did a search of like everything, right? So there was no way we could have brought things in and brought things out but she failed a drug test. Um, so they took visitation away from us. Of course, um, if you ask any of that staff, I did not take that well. In fact, I said, I'm still gonna drive up to that gate, and if you let me in, you don't, but I will stand out there and I will try to see my daughter every single weekend. And um, when when they uh, said all that, then we, we looked into it. They saw how persistent I was about, you know, I don't understand how this could have happened. You know, you search everything. Like, we're always very cooperative, you know, with the rules and things. And uh, long story short, they found that staff gave it to her. Um, it was one of those marijuana pens. Um, so it was easily, you know, able to be able to get, you know, hidden when they come in and to give to her. Um, Y'all, this is the first time I've ever shared that information. Um, so Maddie was on probation, and so they decided to pull her from the facility. Um, and they put her in a drug rehab. <laughs> she didn't have a drug problem. She smoked marijuana, okay? And I was very hard on her about it because I've watched drugs ruin people in my family, including her stepdad, and, um, but she didn't have a drug problem. And um, so they put her there, and she ran away. And, um, and, and that, was, that was a really hard process because, like she said, one of y'all said, um, most victims go back seven times. Um, Prior to, before I go into that, I actually put um, some statements that Maddie wrote in her, uh, her journal while she was in the refuge, um, so I'd love to share that with you. I want to put a smile on everyone's face when I walk into the room. I want God to shine through me. I want others to respect me and to treat me with loving kindness. Blank, her trafficker, which we have in jail, um, actually took a video of, of us having sex. I was so effed up, I didn't even remember he took that video. 
I was told, I'll, I'll kill you, bitch. So at first, I didn't want to risk my life. But in the end, I told the FBI everything, and I was believed because I had videos and evidence and everything on my phone to prove it all. Y'all, that video was on Snapchat, and he sent it to my son every single day. I wish I would have never told anyone because now I'm scared for my life. Most of the time, my reaction is to fight, but my body is also used to never winning in the situation when it's, when it's a grown man and I'm only 15 years old. My sexual abuse was forced. I was taking pills to numb the pain. There were two guys who trafficked me, one blank 20 years old, another one blank 35 years old. I was forced to make a living on my own after running away and I was vulnerable. That's how it all started. I was put on Molly. Y'all, I didn't even know what half this stuff was. I had to Google it. Um, and bars, and I barely even got to eat. I was beaten for looking at another guy for too long or for not meeting my quota or even just for being tired of it and saying the slickest, oh, slickest shit I could say, think of. That, that's how she talked. <laughs> um, I was controlled by him in a way that Every time a trick would text my number, he would tell me what I was going to do, no matter what, and always controlled my money. He got half of everything I made, sometimes more. Unfortunately, there were two incidents. Oh, wait. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so after she got, so those are her journal, and, and, and I, I cherish those a lot. They're really hard to read, but um, I keep them in a safe place because I feel like that's literally her speaking from her heart and all I have left of her. Um, but so she went to the, um, the rehab, ran away, um, and she would call me, you know, and let me, Hey, I'm, I'm okay. I'm like, where are you at? She wouldn't tell me. And at this point it was like, okay, I, I see that we, it was the habitual runaway and the police weren't really doing much. Right. So at this point I was just like, I just need to know that you're okay. You know, I just, I was communicating with her probation officer, letting her know I was hearing from her, but we just kind of took out that last step because I didn't feel like we were getting anywhere at that point. Um, then I didn't hear from her. And so I had her friends start checking her Snapchat because she was notorious about having her, her stories and it, 24 hours, she had to have something all, all the time going. Um, and she was in a hotel. And she was in a hotel with some people, and I didn't recognize all of them. Um, but then she called me. Um, and she called me crying, um, and she told me that she needed to go to the hospital. And I was like, where are you at? I'm coming to get you. And she's like, it's not safe. Well, any mama don't care. She's like, I'm going to be packing. I'm coming with something. It's going down. I don't care. Um, but she wouldn't let me. And so I said, can you get to a hospital? And she said, yes, I will. And I said, when you get there, I need you to give me the address. Me and my husband were in a route already. Like, we, we had no idea where we were going, but we were going, right? And uh, she called me. She gave me the address. Address is still written on my mirror. It's been two years, you guys. Um, they call me uh, for consent to treat. Absolutely. I'm in route. Um, they call me back. They tell me they need $750 from me. I'm like, what do you need $750 for? Uh, they said, because of HIPAA, they couldn't give me that information. And I'm like, but you can consent to treat. I was a little confused by that. Um, anyways, long story short, they allowed her to leave. She wasn't there. Um, she went back to the hotel, and um, she was found in the hotel. Her, her Snapchat went blank. She was found in the hotel. Um, when I'm, I'm a trainer, and uh, I'm an outdoor trainer. And when COVID was happening, we were virtual. I was in my garage teaching a virtual class, and I heard this knock on my garage. Well, she was a runaway. Some, you know, sometimes she would do that. She'd knock. She knows I'm doing a class. So I just kind of thought she was going to sit on the porch and wait. The knocking kept happening. And so I, you know, spotlighted somebody else, and I walked over there and opened the garage, and it was two police officers. And they said, uh, you know, we need to talk about Maddie. And I was like, where is she at? What, what happened? You know, I'm thinking they, sh she's in the car, right? And uh, they were like, no, we need to come inside, and um, you need to call the coroner's office. Um, she's 15 years old, y'all. So I turned off the videos. Um, the police sat with me um, 
we call them, and, and I was in denial. I, I, of course, they said that she was there, and I was in denial. And, um, and there's that. Like, my whole world was just, you know, upside down. My husband was out of town at the time. My boys were upstairs asleep. They were about to get ready for, you know, get up for school. I'm like, how, what do I do? Like, you know, they're going to come downstairs. Like, how do I, I can't just send them off to school. Like, hey, your sister just died. Like, you know? Um, but what makes this really hard, you guys, is um, I love to hear what you guys are doing um, to fight this. But Maddie will probably never get justice in her case. Um, she had the date rape drug in her system, but they ruled it a suicide and they closed her case. It happened in June. Supposedly, they, cu they closed the case in July. They never called me. HPD never called me. Not one phone call to let me, to give my piece of that information that Maddie called me from the hotel. You know, like when I finally got the statements and stuff, nothing, it doesn't all add up, y'all. And what I was told by an HPD officer who is in the trafficking sector um, is that I'm, I'm in denial. I'm in denial of what my daughter did to herself. So I started educating myself, and I do a lot of work with Unbound Houston, um, and I learned that very few victims get out. Um, murder and suicide happens. And um, so I, you know, as I'm educating myself, I'm like, okay, just help me understand how this happens. You know, just like I don't know what Molly was and bars were, maybe I don't really know what the date rape drug is, right? But it's to my understanding that you aren't really there or you're sleeping. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. So since I don't feel like we're ever, oh, I forgot the biggest piece of this. The man that checked her into the hotel is a registered sex offender for trafficking a 15-year-old girl out of California. He currently lives in Las Vegas. So since I have fought and fought and fought and fought and we're getting nowhere with that, that's why I started Maddie's Movement, and I decided that I want the whole world to know Madeline Bennetson's name, and I want every little bit of someone's hope in this space to know that Maddie is there with them through the whole process, you know, to be able to get out and to turn their life around. We have this really quirky, um, I started a, a private Facebook group that started as my very grieving, vulnerable, hard space to be in just to kind of be there for my my family. It started with my family. And what do we have, 1,300 people in that group now? Um, we talk about safety. I mean, in the area, you know, I, I, I share tips and stuff like, no, you're not going to get, you know, kidnapped at Target or wherever, Walmart. Y'all were hating on Walmart. So, um, you know, but those things do happen, right? So I don't want people going and just being like, la, 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 I'm not going to get kidnapped because those things happen. Um, so we share those. We celebrate whenever we do get justice for people. Um, when missing kids um, go missing, we share them and we blast them. I mean, they can be from Canada, but I don't care. A trafficker will take a, a, a human as far as they will go to make a dollar, you guys. And so if there's a child that's missing in Canada, you share that and you help that mama get that baby back. And so that's what we do in there. And we do um, events every single month because I want to educate people. Um, anyway, you guys, find Maddie's Movement. I love you all so much. I want you guys to focus on being more proactive. Not that these guys aren't doing amazing things because you are, but unfortunately in Maddie's case, um, there's no justice. And so y'all just remember Maddie's name and and y'all bind together. We all have to come together. Organizations, you know, um, citizens, go vote, you guys. Vote yes. good people into, yes, legislation. Yes. Like, get involved because what I've learned with this is your voice matters. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Nikki. We have one more survivor to speak, Catherine McAdoo. She is a survivor of sex trafficking here in the greater Houston area. She graduated magna cum laude from University of Houston downtown. Yay. 
Today, she is a case manager and recovery coach for Santa Maria Hostel's STARS program. STARS stands for Survivors of Trafficking Achieve Recovery and Stability. The program provides housing for labor and sex trafficking for up to two years, in addition to trauma-informed counseling, substance abuse recovery, medical and mental health services, job training, and more. Please welcome Catherine. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hey. <laughs> My name is Catherine McAdoo, and I am a survivor leader. Um, I ran away when I was 16. By the time I was 17, I was working at the Butt Naked. Um, when I was 20, I met my um, perpetrator. Uh, he presented himself as a friend, someone I could talk to. Later, I found out that's called Romeo pimping. I, um, you know, had a troubled childhood, and and I had he was somebody who would listen to me talk. He would take me out. He would give me free drugs. Uh, he would buy jewelry for me, and and he never asked for sex. So, you know, in retrospect, like a 45-year-old man with a 20-year-old woman who's not asking for anything but giving her drugs, you know, something was wrong, right? But I, I didn't have anyone in my life at that time because I was out on the streets on my own to tell me these things. Um, one night he took me to a warehouse that is directly adjacent to the Parkland housing projects in the alley behind the El Napolito in Galveston. Um, he took me to this warehouse where he had given me some more free dope. And uh, he let me, you know, do the dope and do my thing. And then when it was time to leave, I was ready to go. The dope was gone. Uh, he told me I wasn't going any motherfucking where. And he beat my ass and he raped me. Um, as I lay there crying, he put a chain around my leg and I lived in that warehouse with that man for the next two years. Um, it was a revolving door of men. Uh, not only did he pimp me out, um, he was a sadist. So, um, he would stick things in me, tools, sticks, anything to make me open up bigger so I could service more customers, right? Um, he ended up going to prison and, uh, I did the only thing I knew how to do. I, by that point in my, 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 um, abuse, the abuse that I had suffered, um, I had had moments of, of, of clarity. I would cry. I would want to go home. He would shoot me up. Um, all and heaven forbid, if I didn't do what he asked, he would take the dope away. Oh my God. And then all those feelings of shame and guilt and, and, and would flood back. So when he ended up going to prison, I did the only thing I knew how to do, which was sell my body to get drugs because I couldn't handle what had happened to me in that warehouse. Um, and I spent the next 17 years living in the streets under bridges behind dumpsters. Uh, and then, um, one day I met, I met Kathy Griffin, and for the first time in my, li my life, there was a woman who was telling my story. Now, I, I, I want y'all to know that I, I've been to these many rehabs, right? And nobody, 20 years ago, nobody ever wanted to talk about trafficking. Well, we don't want to talk about that. Let's just talk about your drug use, right? Well, let's not talk about why I use those drugs, right? Um, and... Uh, when I met Kathy Griffin, I was actually trying to escape a, a, a pipe charge. Yep. yep. And um, ended up that pipe charge saved my life. Um, I met Kathy at 32. I've been sober 13 years now. Um, I, uh, here was somebody who believed in me. She told me, you're smart. Go back to school. So I did. I came to UHD. Yeah. 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 Um, I said I never wanted to have some of the things 
the challenges that I had to overcome in trying to get sober and trying to overcome some of that trauma that happened to me, that I, I said I never wanted it to happen to another woman. And I, I tell y'all my story because um, I, I, I believe that I was baptized by fire so that I could help other women just like me. And today, I run the STARS program over at Santa Maria Hostel. And um, I'm doing God's work, I think. You know? Yeah. And we love you. Love you, too. So thank y'all for letting me share my story, short and sweet, but um, impactful, I think. So thank you. So I would say these three women are my heroes, but we actually have a lot of survivors in this room tonight. Um, they always say you never know how strong somebody can be till you have to be, and we know no other way. I loved the way Catherine Griffin described it as throwing that rope back to help somebody else, and we all have the power to do that because it's only through lived experience that we can truly understand what it means to be abused and neglected and ignored. Um, and the strength that all of y'all possess um, is amazing to me and heartfelt. Love you, Miss Becca. So thank you for being strong and courageous enough to share with us tonight. So in closing, um, we do also have a whole lot of social workers in the room, and us social workers love resources. So um, really, what can you do from here? So tra trafficking victims are in every single one of our communities. They are hidden in plain sight. We want you to be able to, they can be any age, race, gender, nationality. We want you to learn the signs. Educate yourself in your community. Spread the word and report and do something. So how do you report? If you see something immediately going on that doesn't look right, call 911. If you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, you could help somebody and save them. If the victim looks to be under the age of 18, DFPS is where you would report if it's not an active ongoing emergency place, and there's where you can report DFPS. The National Human Trafficking Hotline is 1-888-373-7888. You see this QR code, you can take a picture of it. Um, don't scan it, but just take a picture and you can access it when you get home. This is a list of human trafficking books that's on an Amazon wish list. Um, I just heard about a few more I'm going to be adding to it. So every time I find a book that speaks to me, I add it to this list to share with others. And so we say do something. How do you do something? Over the course of the next three days, we're going to be having quite a few nonprofits that come and speak to us. Research. Look at all of these nonprofits and research who they are and what they're doing. They cover a whole litany of victimization, and there is room for you. There is something for you to, to do, whether you want to work with child survivors, adult survivors, incarcerated individuals. Um, I truly believe that if we all individually find something to work on, collectively, we can move mountains. I would like to say a special thank you to that guy on the right over there, Mr. Volano. He has been amazing yeah. to work with. And just so you know, our three-day series will be on UHD YouTube in about a week. And so we can share each one of these evenings with our friends, our neighbors, our family, our community to be able to educate them as well. If you can, here is another QR code. We love QR codes here. Um, scan and talk about the event, what was good, what was bad. We love to learn from our experiences. Um, we do have an event tomorrow, one more evening, and it is social justice advocacy. We're going to have three nonprofits from the greater Houston area that have wonderful public policy teams. That's Children at Risk, Street Grace, and No Trafficking Zone that we talked about earlier. So before I leave and wish y'all good evening, we have two giveaways, and it's about this picture to my left. Becca Carey with Hands of Justice came to me and said, I'm going to do a book, and she asked me to be a part of the book. The book was very special because it took 20 survivor stories, and you had to write your story. But she only gave you, what, two pages? Your story in two pages. I just want you all to write, know that, notice that. So two pages. And so she, the stories were taken, and they were given to artists. The artists never met the survivors, and the artists drew a picture from what they read. My artist that got my story wrote, 
did this. Wow. Uh, my sister was also a survivor, same perpetrator. She was a high school math teacher, and so she couldn't help me when I decided to work to change laws. The artist, without knowing, because it wasn't in my story, used a math book. Wow. It circles my face in this image. And there's also paint going down the nose. It's in my older sister's favorite color, purple. And so when I saw this image for the first time, um, it spoke to me. And so we want to give away two of Becca's books. And these books, again, Becca kind of went over it. They are 20 survivor stories matched with artwork. And for all of us social workers that love information and research, it talks about all the different forms of trafficking. It is a book that everybody needs to put on their list to read if you are a social worker. So first, today is what, October 19th? Um, who has the closest birthday to October 19th? You, you, you have your own books. Last week, OK. Yay. When you exit, we do have a resource table. I ask you all to grab as many resources as you need. Um, there's also three QR codes, and one of them is a QR code to buy when silence ends. It's, it is on Amazon, so you can get a copy as well. The other book it's going to go to January 11th is National Human Trafficking Awareness Day. So whose birthday is closest to January 11th? Okay, what is your birthday? 16th? The 13th. I think. I think that's actually even, right? Yeah. What? I can give one to you. Here. What's your birthday? You're farther away. You're farther away. You know what? Grab another book. We'll give them to both of them. So I'll, I'll, I'll do that. So in closing, closing, like for real, for real. Um, <laughs> Tomorrow is our final night, and I hope that you can come. If you can't come in person, definitely come virtually. I will be rocking a bright orange dress because I'm going to the Astros game afterwards. So with that, good evening. Oh, one more thing. If anybody wants to do the red sand project, um, I actually have about 20 packets of red sand I can give to, uh, I've got 20 packets here. And then don't forget to do the survey, the survey to talk about what you liked or disliked, because we love to grow and get better here. Thank you.